Chapter 1 Kenneth K. woke up in the back of an ambulance, racing towards Lafayette General. He began coughing violently, and the EMT helped him roll onto his side to clear his airway. What happened? Kenneth asked. The factory caught on fire, the EMT replied. Is everyone okay? Kenneth asked, worried. The EMT didn't respond, instead focusing on monitoring Kenneth's vitals and ensuring he could breathe properly with the oxygen mask. At Lafayette General's emergency room, the victims of the Bender factory fire were being treated based on the severity of their injuries. No, you should see her first, Kenneth insisted, as he was wheeled ahead of Patsy Bordelon. You have head injuries. She has burns, the orderly explained. What? I don't have. Kenneth started to say before blacking out again. When he woke up, sunlight streamed into his hospital room. The room was shared with Big Mike, a small man with a stocky build. We're lucky to be alive, Big Mike groaned when he noticed Kenneth was awake. Yet Kenneth groaned, not feeling lucky at all. I heard some of our co-workers died, Big Mike said, and then began sobbing softly. Kenneth mourned the loss of his friends as well. What happened, man? Big Mike asked. I don't know. I was getting a drink from the vending machine, and then I woke up in an ambulance, Kenneth admitted. Four days later, Kenneth was released from the hospital, while Big Mike remained with a broken back. Jennifer Kay, Kenneth's wife, drove to Lafayette, a 40-mile drive, to pick him up. The tall blonde made it clear that she was not thrilled about making the long drive. Kenneth sat beside her, wondering why he had ever married her. She was beautiful, but her attitude and behavior were far from desirable. They had gotten married when Jennifer became pregnant, and Kenneth decided to put aside his dreams of becoming a professional athlete or a rock star. He took a job at the Bender Mattress Factory and saved money to provide a better life for their growing family. Jennifer gave birth to a baby girl named Jadia Ann Kay. Jadia? Kenneth wrinkled his nose at the unusual name. Yeah, it's a unique name. I remember a girl from school named Veresa, and I thought it was so cool that her mom gave her a special name. There are so many Jennifers out there, but not many verses, Jennifer explained. Jadia? Kenneth asked again, not completely convinced. It's like Nadia, but with a J, Jennifer clarified. Kenneth sighed, realizing that arguing was pointless. Before Jadia could even walk, Jennifer announced she was expecting again. All right, but this time I get to choose the name Kenneth insisted. M.M. Ham Jennifer replied, knowing she would decide the name. Their second daughter, Jalissa Amy Kay, was born with blonde hair and her mother's blue eyes. Jalissa? A go. Kenneth frowned. It's like Melissa, but with a J like my mom's name, Jennifer explained, cooing at the baby. The couple's third daughter, J.C. Alice Kay, was born with brown hair and brown eyes. While Kenneth wondered about her parentage, he focused on caring for her and protecting her, as J.C. had formed a strong bond with him. One day, Kenneth caught Jalissa about to harm J.C. and gave her a spanking. Jalissa falsely accused Kenneth of hitting her, and Jennifer sided with her daughters, causing tension in the household. Years later, as Kenneth drove down I-10 in his truck, he questioned why he had married Jennifer who revealed her infidelities and plans to continue dating other people. She taunted him and threatened to take away their youngest daughter, J.C. Kenneth was left in shock as Jennifer flaunted her actions and made it clear that she would benefit financially from a divorce. Daddy, I swear I didn't know about any of this, J.C. cried, hugging her father. It's going to be okay, Kenneth reassured her, embracing her tightly. Chapter 2, Kenneth gave Jennifer the finger as she left with another man in a car blaring music. You'll never get this again, she sneered. I should make Cecil come in here and beat the crap out of you, she hissed hatefully. Wouldn't recommend it if I were you, he said easily. Forget you, jerk, she snapped, not being able to think of anything else to say. Never again, but hurry up. Don't keep your friend waiting, Kenneth said, and returned to the computer screen. The door slammed and Kenneth shook his head sadly. Two more mouse clicks and all of Jennifer's credit cards were canceled balances paid in full. He then increased the amount for the mortgage and her car insurance, as well as decreasing the deductibles on both. The increased premiums were paid out of a secret bank account that Jennifer had established. Kenneth knew about her account had known about it for a few years, but since she was only depositing three to four hundred dollars a month into it, saw no reason to make waves about it. It took slightly longer to set up a new bank account under his and his mother's names he did want his children to be cared for, even if, according to Jennifer, he was not the parent of any of them. He smiled as he transferred the $42,580 out of Jennifer's secret account into his new account. 
Finally, he sighed, sat back, and then picked up the telephone. Hey, Mom, he said. Five minutes later, Kenneth stomped up the stairs. Jalissa's room was the first one on the left, so he knocked on it, hard. What? Jalissa insolently barked. Open the door, Kenneth ordered. Go away, she barked back. Fine, Kenneth said and tried the knob. Go away, Jalissa chortled as he rattled the locked door knob. A huh, Kenneth said and took a step back. Jalissa screamed in terror as her door splintered inward. I said open the door, and I meant open the door, Kenneth growled. Now get out of bed and go get in the car. Now, forget you, you can't tell me what to do, the 17-year-old yelled, still terrified. Kenneth yanked her out of her bed by a handful of her greasy hair, slapped her face twice, and said calmly, I am not joking, get yourself in the car, now. Jadia didn't even wait for her father to knock on her door. She was a coward that hid behind her mother or behind Jalissa. She raced down the stairs and got into the back seat of her mother's car. JC looked on fearfully as her father approached. Go ahead, get into the car, Kenneth quietly told her. Yes, sir, JC said. You just wait until I tell mom, Jalissa shrilled as she got into the back seat of the car. Forget what you tell your mom, okay, Jalissa? Forget it, okay? Need me to spell it out for you? I don't care what you tell your mom, Kenneth snapped as he started up his wife's car. Daddy? JC quietly said as they pulled up in front of Burness and Melvin Kay's home. Yes, sweetie pie? Kenneth asked. Please take care of Pebbles? JC begged in her whisper soft voice. Oops, forgot about. Okay, I'll make sure she's okay, Kenneth promised. Pebbles was JC's cat she'd had the animal since she was nine. She'd named it after the Flintstones cartoons. Because she loved the cat, Jadia and Jalissa constantly tried to hurt the animal. Therefore, the animal had a real distrust of everyone except for JC. Wait, what's that mean? Jadia bravely asked. I know you will, JC smiled tightly at her father. Thanks, Mom, Kenneth called out as the girls trooped up to the house. Kenneth drove to Huval's Texaco and bought two five gallon cans, then filled them with gas. Might want to put some newspaper down, the clerk suggested as Kenneth loaded the two cans into the trunk of Jennifer's car. Forget it, Kenneth smiled. Kenneth drove back to the house, located the crate they used to transport the cat to doctor. Dupre's office for her yearly shots and entered the house. As usual, Pebbles was nowhere in sight and did not respond to Kenneth's calls. Finally, he pulled out a can of her cat food and popped the top on it. He dropped the smelly stuff onto one of Jennifer's grandmother's china plates and patiently waited. Finally, the smell won out and Pebbles came out from behind the couch to investigate. Got you, you annoying beast, Kenneth smiled and put both cat and plate into the crate. Jalissa huffed in irritation as her mother's cell phone again went straight to voicemail. Mom, call me back. I'm at Grandma's house. Dad's gone off the deep end. This is real. Call me, she whispered urgently. You don't have to whisper. I know you're calling your mother, Bernice snapped, startling Jalissa. Why do I have to be here? Jalissa shrieked at the woman. Huh? I'm 17. I'm old enough to take care of myself. Yeah, I'm 18, Jadia echoed, standing behind Jalissa. Goodbye, Bernice waved. You don't want to be here? Then I definitely don't want you here. The two girls smirked as they marched towards the front door. How are we going to get home? Jalissa shrieked. No idea. But I don't care, Bernice said, and started to pull bowls out for the stew she was cooking. Then how are we going to? Jalissa asked. No clue. But it's not my problem, Bernice said and put the three bowls on the table. JC Melvin, dinner's ready. Excuse me, Melvin ordered as he forcefully nudged Jalissa aside. Um, where's mine? Jalissa finally asked as JC took her seat at the table. I guess yours is wherever you're going, remember? You're old enough to take care of yourselves. Goodbye, Bernice said, waving her hand. I hate you, Jalissa shrieked at her grandmother. That's nice, dear, Bernice smiled. Goodbye. Kenneth punched a few holes into the gas tank of the car, and after a long moment, a few into the tank of his truck. He then took the first of the five-gallon gas cans upstairs and began in the bedroom he shared with Jennifer. The bed got a liberal dousing, as did the chest of drawers and the low dresser. He sighed as he looked at the 42-inch plasma television, then shrugged and took one of her ridiculous figurines and threw it at the expensive television. His stomach actually hurt when he entered JC's room and began to drench her bedroom in gasoline. He spotted a small framed photograph and picked it up. It was a photograph of him and JC as they posed with the small fish she'd caught the first time he'd taken her fishing. He carried it downstairs and put it on top of the crate. Inside the crate, Pebbles, now done with her snack, was beginning to yowl. 
he went back upstairs and gleefully drenched Jadia's and Jalissa's rooms with the remainder of the first can of gasoline. Then he simply threw the can onto Jalissa's bed. The second can was emptied on all the furniture downstairs. Then he took the crate and the small photograph and left the house. He set the crate and the photograph down at the edge of the driveway and then went to the side of his house. He set up the sprinkler and locked it in place, aiming the spray at Ray's house. On the other side, he did the same, making sure to lock the stream onto Debbie's house. Then he smiled as he looked at the expensive monstrosity Jennifer insisted that they buy the house he did not want, did not like, but had called home for the last 14 years. He opened the front door, struck the fireplace match, and dropped it on the gasoline-soaked oriental rug. Then he closed the door, walked down to the edge of the driveway, and waited. By the time the first fire truck arrived, it was far too late the house was nothing but a ball of flame. Ray's house had begun to smolder, despite Kenneth's care to set the sprinkler on it, so the first fire truck took care to keep the flames away from Ray's house. Debbie's house was set a little further away, so the second fire crew assisted the first crew looking after Ray's house. What happened? Sheriff Dixon Davis asked as Kenneth stood on the opposite side of the street, holding a violently shaking crate and a small framed photograph. I started the fire, Kenneth shrugged. Couldn't keep up with the payments, so my wife, Jennifer, and I decided if we burned it down, we'd get the insurance money, and then we'd, you know, get us a smaller place, one we could afford. You, you started this fire? Deliberately? Sheriff Dixon Davis asked, making sure that Deputy Orville Jackson was close enough to hear Kenneth's confession. Yet Kenneth shrugged, took the kids down to my mom's for dinner, you know, and then went to Hooval's and bought a couple of cans of gasoline and spread it all around. Oh, and did the car too, the payments were killing us, you know, it's a shame though, forgot all about the truck. See, it's paid off. So, when do you think we'll get the insurance money? Sir, where is your wife? Dixon asked. Don't know she said she didn't want to see it, you know. So a friend of hers came and got her Kenneth said, and put the crate down pebbles was beginning to tire his arm. Sir, put your hands behind your back, please, Dixon said. Real dumb, thank Jadia complained as she and Jalissa trudged down Highway 19 toward their house. Could have just waited until after we ate he would have come got us. He wasn't coming back to get us, Jalissa sneered. We'd have been stuck till Mom came and got us. How much further we got to go? Jadia asked. Look around, Jadia, Jalissa said, indicating their surroundings. This look anywhere near our house? I'm going back, Jadia decided. Jalissa wanted to return to her grandmother's house as well but her pride wouldn't let her. Almost like he's happy to be here, Orville noted as they looked in at Kenneth K. Yeah, you figured out what to do about his cat? Dixon asked. Yeah, and here she is, Orville smiled as his sister came into the station. Hey, Barney Fife Willie Wilhelmina Jackson smiled as she handed her brother two small tablets. I would have thought that a big-time policeman like you would know where to get phenobarbital. I do call my little sister, Orville smiled. Thanks, sis. Yeah, now where's that cute Eric Green? Willie asked looking around. Nah, at night off, Dixon smiled. But I'll be sure to tell him you were looking for him. Okay, my dog goes into seizures because I gave you his medication. The least you could do is order that nice boy to take me out, Willie smiled. She turned to leave the station. Oh, and I don't want to go to McDonald's. I prefer somewhere like Manny's or Touch of Sicily's, you hear? She called out as she left the small building. Think we should tell her that Eric's gay, Dixon asked Orville. He is? Orville asked, eyes wide. No, but he's scared to death of that girl, Dixon smiled. Now, Barney Fife, how are you going to get that stuff down that cat's throat? Watch and learn, Orville said smugly. He took the two tablets and crushed them with the back of his service revolver. Then he took three small containers of coffee creamer and emptied the contents onto a small plate. The crushed up tablets were then scraped into the plate. Okay, Dixon smirked as Orville carried his mixture to the small closet they'd stashed the crate. Okay, Dixon smirked as Orville came back, clutching his bloody hand to his chest. Do you have any better ideas? Orville snapped. Okay, Lafayette Animal Control is on its way, Dixon said. Which is why he's the sheriff, and you're not Officer Mike Stevens said as he dabbed some antiseptic onto Orville's bleeding hand. Go get your granddaughter, Burness ordered Melvin as Jadia sat at the table, eating the reheated stew. The Braves are up by one. It's the top of the eighth, Melvin argued. Just go. I guarantee nothing will happen in the ten minutes. You'll be gone, Burness said. I'll watch it for you and tell you what happened, JC offered. Okay. On three, one, two, three, Melvin said. Go Braves. 
JC and Melvin cheered as Melvin opened the door. You guys are so silly, Bernice smiled. Melvin spotted Jalissa, sitting on the side of Highway 19, hunkered down. He smiled tightly, she hadn't even managed to make it two miles before giving up. He did a tight U-turn, then pulled up and stopped in front of her. He lowered the passenger window. Get in, he ordered. Jalissa didn't say a word, just lumbered to her feet and got into the car. Melvin smiled in mild satisfaction as Jalissa wiped her tear-streaked face, trying to keep him from noticing. Grandma's heating up the stew for you, Melvin said quietly, as he drove up in front of the house. Thank you, Jalissa whispered. Cecil was not amused as Jennifer's MasterCard and Visa were both declined. Grumbling, he fished out three crumpled $20 bills and slapped the bills onto the small platter the waiter held out. Oh, the bill is $59.19, the waiter quietly said. Yeah, Cecil spat. That's three twenties, isn't it? Ah, yes, sir. Very good, sir, the waiter said tightly and walked away. They expect a tip, Jennifer hissed. They can expect nothing doesn't mean I have to give it to them, does it? Cecil spat. Well, I was going to suggest we take this to the Hilton and Towers, but for some reason my cards are. Jennifer said and smiled to herself as the waiter dumped Cecil's change on the table in front of him. Thanks, Cecil sneered at the man. Oh, my pleasure, sir, the waiter smiled as Cecil made a show of counting out the change and leaving the penny for the waiter. So what are you saying? Cecil asked as they waited for the valet to bring his car around. I guess I'm saying, I know I promised you a nice date, but... Up, Jennifer said. Backseat work, Cecil said, and yanked open her door for her. Tell Animal Control that's my daughter's cat, her name is JC, and here's the phone number where they can reach her, Kenneth said as Orville, hand swathed in bandages, made the rounds of the cells. What? Orville said, disbelieving. The cat belongs to my. Kenneth repeated. You knew that an hour ago and didn't say anything? Orville asked, voice growing in volume. Wasn't a problem an hour ago, Kenneth shrugged. I'll call her Orville snapped and stomped away. I told you, I really think he's having fun back there, Dixon smiled as Orville grumbled under his breath. Okay, any sign of his wife? Orville asked. Nope says he doesn't know the name of the friend of hers, other than Cecil Dixon shrugged. Watch, that we find out he not only knows the guy's full name, but his phone number, address, his mom's phone number and address, and what size shoes he wears. Crum Orville snapped. How's the hand? Dixon smiled. Jadia and Jalissa snuggled down on the sleeper sofa in the living room far enough away from the den to not be disturbed by the baseball game, but close enough to hear JC and Melvin's cheers. Why does JC get her own room here? Jadia asked Jalissa. And why do we have to sleep on this uncomfortable couch? Because she's the favorite, Jalissa sneered. She's always trying to please everyone. I hate her, Jadia said. I hate him, Jalissa countered. Well, I hate him too, Jadia agreed. I hope mom gets in trouble, he's such an idiot, Jalissa said forcefully. Yeah, did you hear when she called him that? Jadia laughed. Jennifer got out of the car and stared in disbelief at the charred and smoldering remains of her home. What happened? She asked, not really expecting a response. Close the door, huh? Cecil ordered. What? Jennifer asked, looking at him incredulously. Close the door, I'm running late, Cecil ordered. Are you just going to leave me here? Jennifer asked. What? What do you want me to do, huh? Take you home with me? Cecil sneered. Yeah, I can see my family going nuts over that. Mrs. K? Okay? Officer Becky Zima asked. Hey, officer, you need to move that car, okay? Cecil ordered Becky's cruiser was blocking his exit. You, let's see some ID, Becky ordered him. Now, are you Mrs. Jennifer K? Officer, what happened to my home? Jennifer asked. Please answer the question, Becky snapped. Are you Jennifer K? Yes, yes, I am, Jennifer agreed. Now, had happened to my home? Jennifer K, put your hands behind your back. Jennifer K, you have the right to remain silent. Becky began the routine. Jennifer was in a daze as she was taken into custody, fingerprinted, searched she did manage to call Becky Zima a mean name, and then put into a cell with three women that chattered and laughed with each other. Your arraignment is tomorrow morning, Becky patiently explained to Jennifer Kay, who was very angry. At that time, your bail will be set. Until then, why don't you try to get some sleep, huh? Why don't you go away, annoying person? Jennifer hissed back. In the morning, Jennifer was assigned Donald Pelichet as a pro bono representative. Donald held a serious face as she protested her innocence and glared angrily as Donald explained that her husband had implicated her in their scheme to burn their house down for money. Really? Kenneth asked Sophia Kutcher, 
his own pro bono defender. You mean that's illegal? But I was just doing what my wife told me to do. See, she's in charge in our family. You can ask anyone. They'll tell you Jennifer's the boss. You mean person. Jennifer screamed at Kenneth as they finally saw each other inside the saint. Elizabeth Parish Courthouse. Kenneth smirked at Jennifer as both Donald and a bailiff forcibly held her back. You meanie. I am going to get back at you. Jennifer screamed at him as he was taken into the courtroom to face Judge Jack Melancon. Quit trying to be helpful, Kenneth whispered to Sophia Kutcher, as the lawyer actively demanded that her client be released with no bail. What? she asked, surprised. I said, quit trying to be helpful, let me sit where I am, Kenneth said, and she finally looked at the assistant district attorney. Adam was quick to agree that Kenneth should remain in jail and Kenneth was moved to DeGuard's jail to await trial. Okay now, mister. Okay, what's really going on? Sophia asked. And yes, this is being recorded. The system is terrible, Kenneth said calmly. My wife goes out and does her own thing while I'm supposed to just sit there and accept it. I asked for a divorce, she gets everything, and I get stuck with all the bills. She barely worked, but I had to work hard and give her everything. And now she wants to say it was my idea to burn down our house so she can go on vacation with her friends on my money. No, Mrs. Cutter, leave me in jail. If I'm not working, she's not getting a cent of my money. Yeah, the system is terrible, Sophia agreed. My ex-husband cheated on me with both men and women while I was working hard to put him and myself through school. As soon as he got his degree, he said he found his true love and I was still stuck paying all the bills he left behind. That's awful, Kenneth said. Yep, but there is a positive side to all of that, Sophia smiled. I met my husband thanks to my ex leaving me. And his true love turned out to be HIV positive. Ouch, Kenneth smiled. Okay, mister. Okay, we'll see you in a couple of months, I guess Sophia shrugged and got up. Chapter 3 Donald Pelichet was more than happy to release Jennifer Kay as a client she insisted that he was not giving her special treatment over his other clients. Of course I'm not their paying person, he muttered after yet another argument. Dixon Davis understood and sympathized with Donald as he walked out of the police station. Don't know who she's going to contact, but it won't be me, Donald warned Dixon. Jesse Johnson entered the room, listened to Jennifer's explanation, and took the information from her regarding her secret account. Gee, there's a lot of money in it by now, she said. Just get me out of here. Jesse entered the information on his laptop, cleared the user Idaho field, and tried it again. Mrs. K, don't know how to tell you this, but, Jesse said after a long moment. Let me see that Jennifer barked, jammed her fingers on his keyboard, and screamed in anger when she realized that the account was empty. That sneaky person, she growled. And of course, since the house is in both of your names, Jesse went on. What house? Jennifer screamed. That person burned it down. What I am getting at, Mrs. K, is you've hired me as your attorney, but not as a pro bono attorney, mister. Pelichet was your court-appointed attorney, Jesse said. My services are $350 an hour. Do you intend to pay me? Great, just great, Jennifer sighed. Get that lazy person back in here. It's been a pleasure, Jesse lied and left the room. Come on, Becky said, leading Jennifer back to her cell. Going to make you mine, hear me, punk? Jamal Westinghouse sneered as Kenneth sat on his bunk, reading Brave New World for the hundredth time. No thanks, Kenneth said calmly but have a nice day. Talking to you, Jamal yelled, grabbing the book out of Kenneth's hands. Kenneth's first punch landed on Jamal's throat, making it hard for him to breathe. Then Kenneth calmly stepped on Jamal's head until Jamal's body stopped moving. Any of you think you're going to mess with me? Kenneth asked as he picked up his book. A.W., no need to come at us like that, huh? One of the other men complained. Huh? Don't call me that mean word, huh? I didn't do anything to you, right? Right. And you didn't do anything for me either, huh? Where were you when that guy told me I was his new prisoner? Or when he took my stuff, huh? Kenneth asked. Didn't think you needed help, you know, the man muttered. What the heck? Captain Charles Villot shouted as he saw Jamal Westinghouse's dead body lying on the floor. It was an accident, I think Kenneth shrugged. Oh, just great, Charles complained. Jennifer happened to be leaving the courtroom with five other women in the Bender police custody when a heavily handcuffed Kenneth Kay was led into the courtroom. What's he doing here? Jennifer asked Becky Zima. They're not releasing him, are they? Not sure I heard he killed another prisoner, Becky shrugged. Jennifer looked over her shoulder as the three armed police officers led Kenneth into the courtroom. 
Him. You're kidding me, he's a total wimp. Jennifer laughed. No, no, they must be thinking of someone else. Oh no, Grandma, Burness said. There's no way I'm letting you go to Northside. Why not? Jadia asked, taking a big bite of her chicken salad sandwich. Me and Jalissa went there. Aha, and look at how well you turned out, Melvin said, earning himself a smack on the back of his head from Burness. No, Grandma, we can't afford that school. JC complained. Don't worry about that, leave it up to me, Bernice said. Um, when do you think Mom will come get us? Jalissa asked. I mean, they have to know she had nothing to do with burning the house down, right? Oh, and I'm sure your dad will be getting out soon too, Bernice reminded the girls. Well, it's been like a month, right? Jadia asked, finishing her sandwich. Yep, it's been a month, Melvin agreed. Four long weeks of I'm bored and there's nothing to do and when is my mommy coming and... Quiet, you. But Grandpa's right, Bernice said. What? Jadia asked, looking at her grandmother. You and Jalissa are out of school, now I know. I went to the graduations, Bernice said. Yep, they reward average performance nowadays, Melvin said, earning himself another hit to the back of his head. So, do you think it's possible for you two to show some initiative? Get a job, maybe? You know, the kind where they pay you for your work, Bernice said firmly. A what? Jalissa asked. A job, you know, where people get up and dressed and go to work so they can earn money. You might have heard of it, Melvin said. It was in the news, even on TV. You're joking, right? Jalissa sneered. No, I'm serious, Bernas said. I've asked you to help around the house. I'm not running a hotel here with free food and clothes, but neither of you lift a finger. What about her? Jadia argued, pointing to JC. Huh? What about her? Bernice asked, putting her hand on JC's shoulder. Who helped Grandpa with the brass yesterday, huh? And helped me change the oil on the car the day before that Melvin added. And got most of the oil on herself, Jalissa retorted. It doesn't matter, at least she tries. At least she helps. At least she does her part, Melvin said. So, you two have, oh, what's fair, Melvin? One week? Two? Two weeks to find a job? A real job that pays you? Or you can call Grandma Moore and see if you can stay with her, Bernice said. What? You're kidding. Jadia and Jalissa protested. Nope, I'm afraid not, Bernice said. Now, anyone want another sandwich? I'll take one Melvin offered. No, dear, you're not growing anymore, Bernice hugged him. Can I have another, please? JC asked, holding up her plate. Of course, sweetie pie, Burness smiled. Can I have another, please? Jalissa mocked JC. Oh, watch out, there's a dangerous animal on the loose, Melvin joked as Pebbles rubbed against his leg. Grandpa, she's not. JC laughed as Pebbles rubbed against her leg. Now, one of you can go on the computer and start working on your resume while the other looks through the job ads. After an hour, you'll switch Bernays suggested, putting the newspaper down on the table. Jalissa and Jadia looked at each other, worried. The day of the trial of the state of Louisiana versus K and K was a bitterly cold day, and Kenneth was grateful for the coat his mother had bought for him. Sophia and Donald wisely positioned themselves between Kenneth and Jennifer. All rise, the Honorable Harold Monroe now presiding. The bailiff called out. Jennifer smiled as the father of Jadia and Jalissa entered the courtroom. When Judge Monroe asked if all were present and all were ready to proceed, all parties agreed. Your Honor, if it pleases the court, Donald Pelichet began. Jennifer saw no flash of recognition, even when Donald insisted on using her maiden name and the names of her three children in his motion to try her and Kenneth separately. Harold Monroe did recognize Jennifer, even though she was no longer the 19-year-old Wendy's employee that had been so impressed with his luxury car and his fancy watch and his remarkable confidence. But she had been a fling from several years past there had been at least 100 women in between her and now, and none of those women would ever get any preferential treatment either. In the interest of time and the budget of the state of Louisiana, your motion is denied. Please proceed, Mr. Rich Harold interrupted Donald and motioned for the assistant district attorney to begin his case. But I didn't do it. Jennifer screamed out as Adam gave the theory of how Jennifer and Kenneth had planned to defraud Young Insurance Corporation out of nearly $300,000 by committing the act of arson. Counselor, if you cannot keep your client. Harold warned. Yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry, Your Honor, Donald said, putting a retraining hand very tightly on Jennifer's leg. Jennifer continued with her outbursts and was finally removed from the courtroom. Your Honor, my client does not contest the state's case but does ask for leniency, remember. This is a man, 
by the district attorney's own words, that was manipulated and coerced for years by the co-defendant into doing what she wanted. Sophia finally addressed the court after Adam Rich concluded his arguments. And your honor, I ask that my client be released by her own words. She had nothing to do with this terrible act or subsequent attempt to defraud Donald Pelichet said. The court hereby finds you guilty of aggravated arson under Article 4, subsection. Harold Monroe intoned and was a little surprised when Kenneth actually smiled at the 8 to 12 year sentence. Keep your nose clean, you'll be out in five, six years, Sophia whispered and patted her client's hand affectionately. Bye, Daddy, JC sobbed as Kenneth was allowed a brief hug. JD and Jalissa did not bother to come to the trial, Grandma Moore couldn't be bothered with such foolishness. Grandma Moore did find it close to intolerable that at her age, she would be saddled with two spoiled teenagers and deeply resented Kenneth Kay and Kenneth Kay's mother and father for not stepping up and caring for the two brats. But as intolerable and inconvenient as it was, Jennifer's mother could not, in good conscience, turn her own grandchildren away. Maybe we should have looked a little harder, Jadia whispered to Jalissa. You can if you want, Jalissa sneered and turned up the television. No. I mean, we got jobs, we'd be able to, you know, like do stuff, Jadia said. Aha, uh -huh. you can if you want mess with his mom and dad and mess with that annoying girl, JC too, Jalissa said. But I'm bored, sitting around here all the time, Jadia complained. Then go do something, Jalissa shrugged. Melissa Moore came barging into the small apartment and glared at her two lazy, insolent grandchildren. It had been one thing when these two were lazy and insolent to Kenneth Kay, a man she despised for the very virtue of being a man, but it was another thing entirely when they were lazy and insolent around her. Um, do you think, do you think just one of you could pry your useless self off the couch and come take this trash out? She yelled. Fine, fine, Felissa complained and got to her feet. And you, Melissa, barked at Jadia. You think you could maybe do something with this ground beef? Like what? Jadia asked, baffled. Try cooking it. How about that? Melissa asked. I've been on my feet all day, working hard at. Jadia panicked having never cooked a meal in her life and began sobbing in earnest. Oh goodness, stop. Melissa screamed. Fine, fine, but I better not hear one EW. I don't like this. What is this out of you? You hear me. JC fit right in with the other 8th graders at St. Thomas Aquinas, her grades were good and her attitude was good as well. And no one thought it odd that she lived with her grandparents. There were two other children in similar situations in her homeroom. Given the chance, out from the shadow of her two older sisters, J.C. excelled in sports. Coach D. Campion wasted no time in contacting Melvin K. and asking if she could sign J.C. up for junior varsity basketball. Sure, but you just wait until softball season. She's got a powerful arm. I promise you that Melvin told the now excited coach. But I'm too short, J.C. argued. Nonsense, Coach D. said. I saw you grab that rebound and that girl's at least a foot taller than you. No matter where a person sat in the gym, they knew where Melvin K. was sitting and knew that J.C. K. was his granddaughter. Rebounds were cheered, fouls were either loudly argued or loudly called, and points were cheered. Sit down, Melvin, people behind you can't see Burness would calmly say. But did you see that? Melvin would yell. That girl deliberately pushed her. I think your granddad's here, Rain Sneed teased as they huddled up. Yep, J.C. smiled proudly. After losing their last game, J.C. was very quiet on the ride home. What's the matter, sweetie pie? Burness finally asked. I miss my daddy, J.C. admitted. Well, Christmas is coming up. Why don't you write him a letter? Burness suggested. Yeah, we can send him that picture of you and your teammates with that city trophy, Melvin enthused. But I want him to come home, J.C. whined, for once acting like a girl on the threshold of teenage years. Well, me too, Burness admitted. Gosh, he may be your daddy, dad, but are you forgetting? He's my little boy. Jennifer was not fitting in at St. Gabriel's. Because of her beauty, she was targeted for attacks by other prisoners, and male and a few female guards also targeted her. Her haughty, bratty attitude did not gain her any friends when she first entered the system and in the prison hierarchy. First impressions are the only impressions. Also, any sign of weakness was immediately exploited. Her protestations of innocence were jeered by the few that would actually speak to her. But I'm serious, she shrilled. My dumb husband did this to me. Aha, uh -huh, sweetie pie, look around, we're all innocent in here, a girl laughed. And most of us in here because some mother freaking man done messed us over another girl offered. Jennifer began praying on her first night that the next 10 to 15 years pass quickly. Shoot, I'll be 49 when I get out of here, she cried silently. Chapter 4, Kenneth smiled tightly, 
wanting to cry, as he read the latest letter from his daughter. The enclosed photograph showed a young woman just on the verge of adulthood. He wanted to cry as he looked at the photograph, but tears were a sign of weakness and weaknesses were seized upon very quickly in Angola. J.C. stood, dressed in her Clark's Drive and waitress uniform, long brown hair falling around her in a mass of curls, sassy smile on her face as she balanced a tray of food in one hand. Goodness, baby, you're so beautiful, Kenneth murmured as he looked again at the photograph. Her feet were encased in a pair of bright red inline skates, triggering a memory, and Kenneth smiled again. He remembered taking J.C. to a friend's birthday party, held at a skating rink in flowers. Nine-year-old J.C. was nervous about the party. But what if I fall down? She asked. Then you fall down, Kenneth said. But I know you, I know you'll fall down and say, so what? And get right back up and do it again. True to his prediction, J.C. did fall down and did get back up and try again. By the end of the party, she was begging Kenneth to take her back the next Saturday. By the end of that school year, she was begging for a pair of inline skates for her birthday. Can you skate? John Clark asked the pretty 16-year-old girl. Yes, sir. My daddy taught me. J.C. smiled proudly. Got my own, see? She pulled the pair of skates from her backpack. He nodded in agreement, then looked at the application form she'd filled out. Says here you go to St. Thomas Aquinas, that right? John asked, trying hard not to stare at the girl's impressive chest. Yes, sir. Got a 3.8 grade point average, J.C. said, again flashing her beautiful smile. Good, good, now, let me tell you how this place runs, John said, putting her application aside. You mean, I got the job? J.C. asked, breathless with excitement. Well, we're going to try you out, see how you do, John agreed. She almost didn't make it through her first night, John watched out the window as his newest employee spun and glided and danced around the concrete pad. Gosh darn kids out there playing around. He exclaimed to Nancy, the head cook. No, she's not, Nancy said. She's having fun, but you watch. I bet you a hundred bucks she comes in with the most tips tonight. Holy cow. John yelled as J.C. leapt over a wooden bench, racing back into the diner's kitchen. Two cheeseburgers, one with no pickles, the other with no onions. Large fries J.C. called out in her high-pitched voice as she skidded to a stop in front of the soda fountain and began preparing the sodas. See, Nancy said. She's having fun, but she's not fooling around. Aha, uh -huh, John said, not completely convinced. The two other waitresses got out of her way as she quickly passed by, tray loaded down with her order. If she spills that John warned as J.C. skated backward toward her customer's truck. She spills any of it, I'll eat it. Nancy smiled as J.C. whirled around at the last second and placed the tray on the window of the truck. John watched as J.C. prepared to make change and then smiled brightly as the truck driver held up a hand, stopping her. Watch. I bet she gets the most tips, Nancy said, and slid another order out for one of the other waitresses. Nancy got her $100 bill from John. Within a month, J.C. was teaching the other girls how to skate faster, safer, and with more showmanship. Kenneth looked again and frowned he didn't like the bit of tummy that the uniform showed was the t-shirt didn't quite reach the waistband of the shorts. He also didn't like his little girl skating around with her rear end hanging out of the short shorts that were part of the uniform. There's nothing you can do about it, he sighed bitterly and put the photograph into his Bible. The noise level in Angola was close to deafening, but in time, Kenneth had learned to tune it out. He looked around the dimly lighted area and sighed. Angola was the last place he would have imagined himself being when this saga started out more than four years earlier, but here he was, slowly waiting for either death or freedom. Jamal Westinghouse had friends. One of the men that had been in the cell the day he killed Jamal had run into one of Jamal's friends and told the friend what had happened. So when Kenneth Kay arrived at De Quincey, Lamont Harrison was waiting for him. Kenneth didn't know why the almost freakishly muscular black man had targeted him, but knew he wasn't going to tolerate it. Kenneth sat down and dug his fork into the unappetizing slop. This is awful, he declared loudly to everyone sitting at the table. He took a bite and grimaced. I'm not eating this stuff, he declared, stood up, and hurled the tray into Lamont's unsuspecting face. Before Lamont could even get to his feet, Kenneth had grasped the man's head in his hands and gave a vicious twist. Mr. K. the warden intoned. Quite remarkable to me, really. Ninety-four prisoners and not a single person saw what happened. Like I said, I was just getting to my feet and... Kenneth said. Yes, yes, I know, mister. K. you simply couldn't eat the food. Got it, mister. K. Let's see if you like the food at Angola any better, mister. K. the warden sighed. Kenneth looked at the photograph of his youngest daughter again and smiled sadly. 
he picked up the photograph of his oldest daughter, Jadia, and her two children, both boys and both biracial. After her third pregnancy, Del Jadia seemed to remember that she had a father and called JC to get the mailing address for Kenneth. Heaven, she's a high school graduate? Kenneth thought as he read or tried to read through one of her letters. The handwriting was terrible, the grammar unacceptable, and most words that were longer than two syllables were misspelled. But she was sending him letters she was writing to him. And she signed each and every letter love you and miss you, Jadia. He looked at the latest photograph and grimaced Jadia stood, posing in a revealing bikini while Robert and Samuel played in the sand. He grimaced the excitement the photograph gave him was unnerving, and he also grimaced at the numerous tattoos the girl sported. His mother had said when Jadia gave birth to Robert she started sending Jadia $100 a month, but quit sending it when she found out that Jadia was using the money on tattoos. Not food. Robert and Samuel, huh? Kenneth chuckled, knowing that Jennifer had to dislike it. Jennifer had to dislike the fact that she was a grandmother and had to dislike that her daughter would give her own children relatively normal names. Kenneth sat up and started to write a reply to J.C.'s letter. J.D.'s letter was already on its way. He wrote her very short letters. If J.D.'s letters were any indication, it long letters would just confuse her. He debated with himself, yet again, whether or not it was time to write to Sophia Cowder, his lawyer. My dearest J.C., he scribbled. I suppose now is as good a time as any to be completely and totally honest with you, and with Jadia, and with Mrs. Sophia Cowder, about what really happened that night. Better that she have at least one parent present at her high school graduation, he thought to himself. Jennifer Kay barely looked up as she was herded into the courtroom, barely acknowledged Donald Pelichet's greeting, or Sophia Cowder's greeting. I'll be back in time for dinner. She asked finally. That's what we're trying to do here, Mrs. Kay Donald smiled tightly. We're trying to get you to your own home in time for dinner. She looked up then, and then looked at the other lawyer. Five years of prison life had created a mental fog one day blended into the next. One noise blended into the next. One smell blended into the next. There were no harsh lines indicating any type of separation. What? She asked. Kenneth K. confessed he started the fire on his own. He's cleared you of any involvement, Donald said. That's what I tried to tell why all five long years ago Jennifer hissed. Five years of bitterness and anger welling up. Five years. Five long years and now why all are willing to believe me? Payback's a pain, isn't it? Kenneth laughed as he was led past her, heavily shackled, two armed guards guiding him. You jerk Jennifer hissed, anger spraying from her lips. Mrs. K, please calm down, Donald counseled. You want to look as prim and proper as possible in front of Judge Hill. Forget that and forget you too, Jennifer spat. All rise the bailiff intoned. Jennifer glared raw hatred at Kenneth as he very calmly, very clearly outlined the details of that night, including Jennifer's spontaneous confession of numerous infidelities and the behavior of their three children. So, Mr. K, what you are saying is that Mrs. K had no knowledge and did not participate in any way, shape, or form in the arson or in the subsequent attempt to deceive young insurance, Donald asked. No, she did not, Kenneth smiled. And in fact, Mr. Pelichet, there was no attempt to deceive young insurance. You can check with them there never was any claim submitted. Heck, I knew there was no way they'd pay up anyway. If I may, counselors? Judge Stephen Hill asked. Mr. K, why now? Why are you disclosing all of this now, honestly? Kenneth answered. I really thought about carrying it to my grave, forget the woman. For 19 years I worked hard for her and her three kids forget. She knew they weren't mine, laughed in my face about it but our youngest daughter is graduating high school in a few months, and I'd love to be there for that. But I know there's no way that's ever going to happen, but at least her mom could be there. How very noble of you, mister. K. Judge Hill said dryly. Now what? Jennifer asked as Judge Stephen Hill left the courtroom. Now we wait for his decision, Donald said. What? What decision? That guy told him I had nothing to do with. Jennifer sputtered. Aha. Uh -huh. Now we just have to wait and see if he believes him or not, Sophia said. Remember, he is a convicted felon, Donald said dramatically. All rise, the bailiff called out and Judge Stephen Hill returned. Kenneth K. shivered the van was unheeded. People have a bad habit of dying when you're close to them, Frederick Parr smiled, showing a gold tooth. Kenneth didn't say anything, Frederick Parr had a double-barreled 12-gauge shotgun leveled at his chest. Yeah, all kinds of people all of a sudden all up and dying and stuff Frederick went on, smiling broadly. This little white guy? Malcolm Jennings asked, looking at Kenneth. Sure, don't let that little white boy fool you, the other guard snickered. 
He's one tough guy even the other prisoners leave him alone. Is that right? Frederick asked. Malcolm looked from one guard to the other, then at Kenneth. So, what did you do anyway? He finally asked. Kenneth looked at Malcolm blankly, then shrugged his shoulders, turned his head and continued to stare straight ahead. No, no, guy, you know what you did talk to me, Malcolm demanded, sure that the guards were lying, just seeing if he was gullible enough to believe their story. You'll learn, Kenneth finally said, his voice barely above a whisper. People who talk too much don't live very long in Angola. People who know when to keep their mouths shut have an easier time. Bitterness was Jennifer's main companion, and she dutifully took her companion with her everywhere. Martyrdom also came along quite often. Jadia welcomed her mother with excited squeals and genuine happiness, but did not have any room for her mother she lived in a small apartment. Jalissa and her girlfriend were in the process of being evicted from yet another infested apartment when Jennifer found them, so there was no room for Jennifer in Jalissa's home either. Not that Jennifer wanted to live with Jalissa and Rudy anyway. Rudy was a loud, arrogant, obnoxious Puerto Rican girl that had several marks on her arms. JC was still living with Burness and Melvin while she attended school. Oh, no, no, you can always come and see your daughter Burness hasten to assure Jennifer. No, I wouldn't dream of keeping you apart. So where are you staying? That question let Jennifer know that she had no room at the K household. So Jennifer turned to her mother for assistance. Oh, great, just fantastic, Melissa complained. Just got rid of your two brats and now you come here needing a place to crash. Yes, Mother Jennifer screeched. So sorry, Mother. I just got out of prison, Mother, remember? As soon as I find me a job, I'll be out of here, okay? Yes, yes, Melissa sneered. Your two brats said the same thing still waiting for either one of them to actually get off them and find a real job. Malcolm Jennings was sure that Frederick and the other guard had been lying Kenneth was quiet, non-confrontational. Yeah, man. Malcolm smirked, squinting at the photograph of JC in her waitress uniform. Trick that girl right, you hear? Tell her I'll be looking her up five years after I get out of here, understand, dude? Kenneth just looked at the smirking boy and shook his head. I told that boy, didn't I? Frederick asked Kenneth, no broad smile on Frederick's face now as he trained the shotgun on Kenneth. Gee, sir, I don't know what you're talking about. What happened? Kenneth asked, feigning ignorance. Yeah, found him in the shower, Frederick said. Oh, that's terrible, Kenneth said. Gosh, I hope you catch the awful person that did this, sir. Enough with the pretending K, I'm just looking for one reason, just one good reason to pull this trigger. Frederick hissed at the expressionless Kenneth K. Hey there, Snow Bunny. What's your name, huh? Cecil smiled what he hoped was a friendly smile as J.C. skidded to a stop next to his car window. Sir, could you turn your music down, please? J.C. asked, ignoring the man's question. It's disturbing our other customers. I'll be you, hey now. No way I got a right to listen to whatever I want, Cecil said. By J.C. said, turned and skated away. Mr. John, I asked him to turn that music down and he started cursing at me, J.C. said. Oh? Oh. John said and slammed the door of the diner open and stomped toward the car. John firmly told Cecil he had two choices, turn the music off or leave. Grumbling and muttering threats, Cecil chose to leave, glaring hatefully at J.C. as she skated past toward another customer. So, what's the biggest tip you ever got? Terry, a slender blonde asked as she smoked a cigarette during a slow moment. Me? A guy gave me ten bucks if I could jump the bench out front and not drop his hot fudge Sunday J.C. smiled. A guy offered me fifty bucks if I gave him my nasty old clothes after my shift Vanessa, a petite African-American twenty-year-old admitted. J.C. screeched. What did you do? What do you think? I gave him the clothes Vanessa shrugged. Yuck, oh Vanessa, really? J.C. squealed. What? Vanessa shrugged. Wow. The most I ever got was five bucks, Terry admitted. Not for some clothes, huh? J.C. asked and Terry smiled and shook her head no. Oh no, he's back, Vanessa said as Cecil's loud thumping could be heard. By the way, what's a snow bunny? J.C. asked. It means a white girl who works for a black pimp, Vanessa said. Why? He keeps calling me that J.C. said and waved through the window of the diner to get John's attention. Cecil cursed as he saw the man approaching his car. Man, look. All I want is something to eat, all right? He barked angrily at John. And I told you, turn that music off or leave John yelled back. Fine, fine, they're happy. Cecil spat, turning the music off. Now, send that little brown-haired white girl out here to take my order. 
Nope, I'm standing right here. You can give me your order, John smirked as JC and Vanessa skated by, trying to show off to each other. Cecil watched as the two girls completed their round, collecting the empty trays and trash off various cars. Sir? John asked loudly, getting Cecil's attention. Uh, yeah, give me a burger, everything on it, and a diet soda water Cecil ordered. Fries with that? John asked. Does it come with fries? Cecil asked. If you pay for them, it does, John said. Then, no, Cecil said. Really? Your clothes? JC asked again. What do you think he wanted them for? So he could smell them while he slapped his leg, Terry interrupted, and actually laughed out loud at JC's horrified expression. Really? Melissa spat angrily. Really? You've been looking but can't find a single thing, huh? Yes, mother, I have Jennifer lied. But can you believe this? I marked F on the application and they suddenly don't want anything to do with me. Then quit marking F, you were let go, right? Melissa said. Yeah, but it's still on my record my lawyer is working on getting it removed, but until then, I have to put it on there, Jennifer said. JC tiredly walked toward her car. It had been a slow night and slow nights were even more tiring than busy ones for her. At least during busy nights, she would stay moving. Stopping and starting and stopping again took a lot more out of her. Hey, bitch, I need to talk to you, Cecil snarled and reached for her. She reacted on adrenaline and whipped the can of pepper spray out of her purse. Cecil screamed as the strong spray hit his eyes. Blindly, he reached out to slap Jacy, slap the spray can out of her hand. Jacy kept her thumb on the spray until Cecil was grunting and writhing on the ground in pain, unable to breathe. I called the cops, John called out brandishing a flashlight. Go call your grandparents. Let them know you'll be a little late getting home. Melvin was out of bed and dressed before Bernice hung up the telephone. Be careful, don't speed, Bernice warned. My granddaughter is in trouble and all you're worried about is me speeding. Melvin asked breathlessly. Melvin stood and listened as Sheriff Dixon Davis took everyone's statements. Unfortunately, since nothing had really happened, other than Cecil moved to put his hand on JC, there was little that could be done. So you're saying, she has to let him hurt her before you can do anything? Melvin angrily asked the police officer. No, I'm saying, if he had actually touched her, then we could charge him with something. But, obviously your granddaughter is a little too quick on the trigger, so. Dixon patiently explained. To Cecil, Dixon did say, if you bother her any more, I'll pursue you legally, you understand. Cecil did not answer, just groaned as the EMT finished flushing his eyes. Yeah, sure, that sounds great, JC said, then hung up. And how is your mother, dear? Bernice asked, fighting to keep the disapproval out of her voice. Good, I guess JC shrugged. She wants to take me out to dinner, celebrate my graduation, you know. Oh, that's nice, Bernice said, trying to sound cheerful. Manny's Mexican pretty good food there, JC said, and got ready to go. Be careful, have fun, love you, Bernice said. JC peered into the living room and smiled. Melvin lay on the couch, snoring. Pebbles lay on his chest, re also snoring. Grandma, get me the camera, JC whispered. Ha, ah, what? Melvin shook himself awake when the flash from the camera startled him. Sorry, Grandpa, JC smiled. Forgot to turn the flash off. Damn cat, JC. Get your cat off me, Melvin complained. Oh, I would. If I had a cat, JC laughed as the man lovingly stroked the cat's belly. With a hug for both Melvin and Pebbles, JC left the house. I hate cats, Melvin muttered as he sat up. Should throw this thing outside. Let the coyotes have her. Yeah, the cat looks so scared. Bernice smiled. Now, go wash your hands, dinner's almost ready. Where's JC going? Melvin asked, dinner. With her mother, Bernice said, saying mother as if it were a curse. Cecil smiled easily, he ran into Jennifer, vaguely remembering her. Yeah, just wait until you see my daughter, you're going to love her, Jennifer, was enthusing as they pulled up to Manny's restaurant. Aha, uh -huh. is she anything like you? Cecil asked casually grabbing Jennifer's arm. No, not really well, I guess sort of Jennifer laughed. I mean, put long brown hair on me and I guess you got her. You know, Jennifer said. You've probably seen her, she works at that. Oh, what's the name of that place? That drive-in? Clark's? Cecil asked. That's it, Jennifer said, jabbing him playfully. Real long curly hair? Cecil asked, getting his 9mm out of the console compartment of the car. Yeah, hey, what do you need that for? Jennifer asked, noticing the gun. Just in case, Bunny, you know what I mean? Cecil smiled reassuringly. You never know what crazy people come into places like this, you know? JC entered the building, saw her mother sitting at a table and started walking toward her. She hesitated as she saw Cecil sitting next to her mother, smiling suspiciously at her. 
Hi, mother. Um, what's he doing here? I thought it was just going to be the two of us? JC asked. Well, it was Jennifer said, smiling happily. But I ran into him. This is Cecil. He's an old boyfriend of mine. And well, I just kind of thought, you know. Cecil smiled even wider, sitting back so that JC could see the back of his gun. Oh, hey, JC called out, spotting Bobby Corvaros, one of the waitresses at Manny's restaurant. Mom, I'll be right back. Bobby and I went to school together. She graduated last year. Hey, Bobby. JC said, coming up and giving the surprised Bobby a hug. Call the police, please, she urgently whispered into Bobby's ear. That man at my table has a weapon. What? Bobby asked as JC smiled widely. I know. She said loudly. It's like so great to see you. Bobby, we don't have time. You're playing around. Chit-chatting with your little friends, Manny, ordered his daughter. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Talk to you later, JC said loudly. Please, she whispered to Bobby. Bobby nodded and dashed to the kitchen. You ever eat here? JC asked as she picked up her menu and looked through it. Yeah, well, um, like years ago, before your father decided to ruin my life and get me in trouble and sent off to prison, Jennifer spat out, still bitter. He's still there, JC calmly reminded her mother. And I hope he stays there, Jennifer said angrily. So, the number 12? You ever have that? JC asked. My am? Officer Eric Green asked. Is there a problem? Yes, officer. That man has a weapon and I know for a fact that he is a convicted felon and is currently waiting trial on weapons violation, JC said, smiling at a stunned Cecil. Sir, put your hands where I can see them. Stand up slowly, Eric said, hand on the back of his service revolver. You little jerk, Cecil spat. So mom, JC smiled to an ashen Jennifer. Are you supposed to be hanging out with other criminals? What? Jennifer finally sputtered out. I said, are you supposed to be hanging out with other felons since you just got out of prison? J.C. asked loudly. Really? You hate me that much? Jennifer growled at her daughter. Talking about my daddy like that? Hoping he stays in prison? Yes, mother, I think I do, J.C. said, standing up. You do know he's not even your father, Jennifer sneered and stood up at Eric's request. You know what, mother? J.C. smiled. It might not be his blood in my veins, but it is his heart that beating in my chest. I get out, I'll be looking for you, Cecil growled at J.C. That's nice, J.C. smiled sweetly. Officer, you did hear him make a threat, didn't you? Yes, ma, I am. I did, Eric said somberly. Bye, mother, thanks for the lovely dinner, J.C. said, and waved to Bobby. Chapter 5, J.C. stood, walked across the stage, and accepted her diploma. She smiled at the three people that cheered when her name was called, then returned to her seat. After the ceremony, she hugged Jadia, Melissa, and Jalissa and thanked them for coming. Like I'd miss my granddaughter graduating for college. Melissa cheered. Where's... J.C. started to ask Jalissa, and then remembered that Rudy had been admitted to the hospice last week. Robbie and Sammy? She quickly asked Jadia. Eric's got them. It's his day off, Jadia smiled. Oh no, don't tell me he's got them out fishing again. J.C. smiled. Jalissa started coughing and J.C. turned and watched, deeply concerned. Rudy was in the last stages of AIDS and Jalissa didn't look very far behind. Finally, eyes watering, Jalissa ceased her coughing fit and smiled tightly. Now, who's ready for Red Lobster? Melissa said with false cheerfulness. Might as well I know it's going to be pizza tonight, Jadia laughed. Eric's always saying we're going to be bringing home a bunch of fish. Then they get home with all kinds of stories about how they almost caught one. But what do you expect? JC said. He's an enthusiast, not a fisherman. Ooh, I can't wait to use that one on him. Jadia laughed. Jalissa, why don't you ride with me? JC asked putting a loving hand on her sister's arm. Great. Jalissa smiled, revealing a gap where one of her teeth used to be. JC guided them through the parking lot until they reached the old Buick. Can't believe you still have this thing, Jalissa laughed. Offered it to you, to you. JC reminded her. But Rudy said you both would rather have the 2000, remember? Uh, huh, Jalissa said, losing her smile. We didn't even have that money a whole week before it was all gone. J.C. slipped the robe off and dropped it and her cap into the trunk of the car, then got in. Hey, um, J.C.? Jalissa asked when they pulled out onto Johnson Street. Yeah? J.C. asked. I, um, I know I've never told you this, but I love you, Jalissa said. J.C. waited for the moment. The last time Jalissa had said she loved her, she had followed it up with a request for money. When J.C. refused, Jalissa didn't speak to her sister for nearly a year afterward. The next time she saw her sister, it was at Grandma's funeral. 
Melvin had been the first to go from a massive heart attack. Died watching the saints, Burness had said through her tears. On three, J.C. whispered to the man in the casket. One, two, three, go saints. Bernice followed three months later. Complications due to pneumonia, the doctor had said. But J.C. knew her grandmother had died of a broken heart, too lonely without her Melvin to go on. And at the funeral, Jalissa and Rudy had the nerve to ask about the will, if there was one. Um, so if there isn't a will, then everything gets split up three ways. Rudy had asked. Number one, J.C. had said to the insufferable woman. This is hardly the time or the place for such conversations. Number two, you are not family, you are an outsider, so it is none of your business. And number three, yes, there is a will. The probate will be decided three weeks from tomorrow. Both Jalissa and Rudy stormed out, loudly proclaiming how dare J.C. say that Rudy wasn't family and that Rudy was an outsider. I'm more family than you'll ever be, hear me? Rudy had yelled at J.C. Jadia had refused to join Jalissa and Rudy, tightly clutching J.C.'s hand. J.C. smiled, realizing that Jadia was actually terrified of Rudy but was bravely choosing to do the right thing. At the reading of the will three weeks later, Rudy again staged a storming out when Sophia Cowder read that Jalissa was to receive only $10,000. Jadia nodded thanks when she too was awarded a $10,000 check. And to our granddaughter, J.C. Alice K. Sophia continued. J.C.'s softball scholarship had paid her tuition, and J.C. had never wanted for anything, as long as she lived with Grandma and Grandpa. She proudly bought, with her own money earned by working at Clark's, the frivolous things that teenage girls buy, and Grandma and Grandpa proudly bought her the essentials. Melvin and Bernice left the house, the two cars, and nearly $800,000 in CDs, stock certificates, and their savings accounts. Jadia, I don't need all of this, J.C. had said to her sister. You have two kids, you should take some of this. I'll take Grandma's car, mine's about to fall apart, Jadia said. No, I mean, take some of this money, J.C. pleaded. Tell you what, J.C. Jadia said. Grandma and Grandpa wanted you to have it. You hold on to it. If I ever need any, I'll come see you, okay? J.C. made the same offer to Jalissa, with Rudy making all the decisions. So how much did they leave you? Rudy demanded. Rudy, please, this is between my sister and me, J.C. patiently said. Uh, uh, jerk, this is between your sister, me, and you, Rudy yelled. Finally, J.C. decided that Grandpa's car was worth $2,000 and neither Jalissa nor Rudy wanted the car, so she offered them the blue book value of the car. I'll bring the money tomorrow, J.C. said, and got out of the dirty trailer Jalissa and Rudy were living in. Kenneth smiled as he looked at the graduation photograph. God, I sure do have a beautiful little girl, he said aloud, then put the picture down and read her letter. It saddened him, Jennifer whether out of spite or genuine emotion, had told J.C. that he, Kenneth Allen K., was not her biological father. I don't care, J.C. wrote in her long, flowing handwriting. To me, you have always been my daddy. You have always been the man that I love, and I will continue to call you daddy until my dying day. Jadia had likewise been told that Kenneth was not her father, but she just shrugged, a move that angered her mother. Don't you even want to know who your father is? Jennifer had asked. I know who my father is, Jadia said, and continued to mash up the bananas for the banana nut bread she was making. My father is Kenneth K., a man that gave up on a few of his hopes and dreams so that he could provide for his family. Did you know he had a baseball scholarship and there were a couple of teams that were scouting him? So? Jennifer asked, uncaring. Yeah, and he was also a really good bass player too, Grandpa hated rock and roll. But even he said Daddy was really good and probably could have been like a huge star or something, but he put his toys away and went and got a real job when he was going to be a daddy. Jadia went on, mixing the sugar into the bowl. Tell me, mother, did you give up anything for us? Did my father, whoever he is, give up anything for us? So, unless my father died and left me, like a million dollars, I really don't care who he is. Kenneth put Jadia's short, poorly written note down and smiled at the photographs she included with her note. Her fiancé was a police officer in Bender, Louisiana, and was obviously proud of his uniform. Jadia posed with Eric Green, wearing his policeman's cap. In the photograph, she was laughing as Eric tried to take his cap back from her. The next photograph showed her with Robert and Samuel. Robert had on a child's policeman uniform and Samuel had on a child's fireman's uniform. He looked again. In both photographs, Jadia was wearing long sleeves, covering up her tattoos. Good girl, he smiled. From what he could decipher from her note, Jennifer had told her that he wasn't her father, but Jadia didn't care he was her father as far as she was concerned. Good girl, he said again. 
The letter from Jalissa had been a total surprise, and he cautiously pulled the three sheets of paper out of the envelope. Obviously, Jalissa did not trust her own handwriting the letter was printed out. He chuckled to himself she had selected a very bold type. Afraid my eyes ain't what they used to be, he asked himself. Dear Kenneth, her letter started out, and even though he knew that he wasn't her biological father, her failure to address him as father or daddy or dad did hurt. So mom comes over and tells me you're not my father, the letter continued. I'm sorry. I can't think of another man I would be prouder to have as my father. He read on. The letter apologized for her actions of years past, of her disrespect of her attitude toward him. Sign of weakness or not, he allowed a few tears to fall as she disclosed that she was in a hospice, dying of a serious illness. No one gave this trouble to me but me, but the letter said. I made some poor choices. Not you. Not mom. Just me, the letter went on. Kenneth, I know I was a challenging daughter and you've never been anything but a good, loving dad, Jalissa wrote. He smiled tightly. She signed it all my love, Jalissa. Dear Jalissa, dear he wrote. Jalissa smiled as the nurse's aide read the letter to her. She was too weak to hold the pages in her hands, too weak to raise her head long enough to read the letter. Love, Daddy, the nurse's aide concluded the letter. Really? Jalissa asked. He signed it, Love, Daddy. Right here, you can look for yourself, the nurse's aide said, holding up the letter. Again? Jalissa begged. Read it again? Okay, the young woman smiled. Show me, Melissa demanded. Show you what? Jennifer asked. Show me. Show me where the heck you've been looking. Surely I would have found something by now. Melissa screamed. Nobody's hiring. Jennifer screamed back. Everywhere I've been, they just tell me thanks, we'll be in touch, and that's it. You've been to Babbage's. You've been to that new place, oh, what the heck is it, on 52? Melissa asked. I told you, they see F on the application, don't even bother reading the rest of it. Oh, good grief, quit feeling sorry for yourself. Fill out the application and ask for a job, huh? Melissa said and stomped into the kitchen. And let me guess now you expect me to cook your dinner too, huh? Jennifer eased her now quite pudgy body off the couch and lumbered into the kitchen. No, no, I'll fix it, what do we have? Jennifer asked. Been here all day, you haven't looked once to see what we have. Melissa asked her anger quite evident. Jennifer made quick work out of the ground turkey and then slapped a plate down in front of her mother before fixing herself a plate. Meal over. Both women returned to the living room to watch television. Melissa purposefully selected a program she knew Jennifer would hate, a primetime investigative report. Your house, you can watch whatever you want. My house, we watch what I want. Melissa smirked and turned up the volume. Kenneth held out no hope as he shuffled into the garishly lighted room. Again, he was introduced to the three people that the state of Louisiana had decided would evaluate him and his chances of leading a gainful, productive life outside of the penal system. He sat and silently regarded the two uncomfortable-looking men and the unattractive woman. The woman, even in her late sixties, still displayed the long hair of her youth and still used the horribly outdated language of the bygone Woodstock era. He gave elaborate answers to their questions, laying it on as thick as he possibly could. Knowing that there was little to no chance he'd be given a release, there were three unexplained deaths in his file folder. Actually, there were six deaths that could be attributed to him, but he wasn't going to volunteer that information. But he was receiving some morbid satisfaction out of playing pious Petey for them. Well, sir, he said, addressing one of the men, my mom and dad died and I wasn't allowed to go to their funerals, so I guess the very first thing I'd want to do is go visit their grave site, you know? My middle daughter? She's sick, just found that out yesterday. She's not long for this world, so I'd really want to see her say goodbye. And I've got two grandchildren, two boys I sure would like to see them. He almost smiled the woman was eating it up, nodding her head in agreement. But even if she fell for all of his nonsense, she would be overruled by the two bureaucrats in their ill-fitting suits. Well, sir, the mattress factory? I really don't know if they'd take me back. I mean, it's been what? Nine years. Kenneth shook his head. Gosh, I don't even know what jobs are available. Let's see, I'm 48 now. I really don't know what I'd be doing. I guess janitor or something's about the best I could hope for, huh? For nearly an hour, Kenneth answered the questions, fighting the urge to just tell the three paper pushers what they could do with the papers, and with each other, and with their mothers. Thank you, mister. Kay finally one of the men said, and he was led out of the room. Sure as heck hope you get out of here, mother at all unhealthy and stuff having your rear end around Frederick Parr said, not smiling. 
You and I both know there's no shot in heck they'll ever let me out of here, so don't even waste your breath wishing for it, Kenneth said, walking down the dimly lighted corridors. JC took a moment to compose herself, then gathered her laptop case and purse and got out of the car. Through the smoked glass doors of Young Insurance, she could see a bored-looking woman sitting behind a desk. The woman also had multiple tattoos that were quite visible. JC was glad that JD had come to her and asked if she could borrow some money to have some of her tattoos removed. Not the flowers Jadia had smiled. Eric likes eating at the garden. Too much information. JC had laughed. How much do you need? JC smiled at the receptionist and felt slightly puzzled when the woman looked up, did a double take, then returned JC's smile. Hi, can I help you? Michelle Ruiz asked. Yes, JC K. Here to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth Baggett? JC offered. MS Baggett? Michelle said, pushing a button. Yes, a metallic voice asked. Um, JCK here to see you, Michelle said. Please send her back, the voice said. Down that hall, first door on the right, Michelle offered, pointing with her finger. Thank you, JC said, and followed the woman's directions. She entered the office and realized why Michelle had done a double take. Her twin sat on the other side of the desk. Elizabeth Baggett had long, dark, curly hair, deep brown eyes, snub nose, and pouting lips. She had a square face with a strong jawline, slender waist, and slightly rounded hips. When she stood to take JC's offered hand, they were both eye to eye, both at five foot six inches. You went to Saint. Thomas Aquinas, JC said, smiling even wider. I remember everyone was always asking if you were my big sister. I can see why Elizabeth smiled wider. But I'm sorry I don't remember. No reason why you and JC laughed. I was a lowly eighth grader when you were a senior. Go Avengers, Elizabeth smiled and let me see you're here. Sure you hear it a hundred times a day I'm looking for a job. Just got out of ULL business admin, 3.92 JC said, digging out her resume. Have it right here, Elizabeth said, taking her seat again. Printed out the email you sent me. There was another girl people were always asking if we were sisters. Um, JC said, taking a seat. Madison Marcoloni? Elizabeth asked. Yeah, people were always getting us mixed up, even though I had real short hair back then and she had real long straight hair. Yeah, that's it, Madison JC smiled. Okay, now let's see. Elizabeth smiled, picking up JC's resume. Worked at Clark's for six years? Impressive. Seriously, I mean, I see some resumes. There's 10, 15 jobs listed, and I'm wondering to myself, why would I hire you? You're just going to quit in a month or two, you know. What can I say I loved working at Clark's, JC admitted. But I didn't put in four years of college to skate around in shorts in the winter, you know? Oh, I know who you are. Elizabeth laughed. Oh, wow. You're the girl that jumps those benches out front. Yep, that's me, JC laughed. You ever wipe out? Elizabeth asked. A couple of times, one time I had a whole bunch of Sundays and I didn't put one of them on there all the way, and I could feel it slipping and tried to correct it wound up spilling all of them all over the place, JC smiled. The guys felt so bad for me, they got out of their car and cleaned it all up before I even came back with their replacement Sundays. Got a $20 tip out of that. Well, I'm afraid it'll be a little boring around here, Elizabeth smiled. No ma and JC smiled. There's the skate park out in Flowers, it's mainly for skateboarders. But I get out there and show them what a girl can do. And on Sundays, I go motocross racing. Believe me, I won't be missing out on anything. Motocross? Elizabeth asked with wide eyes. JC had discovered her father's motocross trophies and had begged Melvin to tell her about her daddy's motorcycle racing days. Then they heard that there would be a race held in Jack's Creek, and JC begged Melvin to take her to see it. The sun had been scorching hot, the track dusty, the concession stands had run out of sodas and bottled water, the noise level was deafening, and JC had loved it. Here's the 125 class Melvin had said. That's the class your daddy raced in. Used to call them the animal class bunch of crazy kids who didn't realize they could get hurt out there. JC watched as the 14 boys raced around the track for three laps, pushing and fighting as they vied for position. Oh my goodness. JC screamed as one biker barely missed colliding with another biker after taking the highest jump at great speed. I'm going to do that, JC firmly told her grandpa as they drove home that miserable Sunday. Melvin looked at the sunburned girl and nodded his head. He knew he wasn't going to convince her otherwise and her grandmother wasn't going to approve, but she wasn't going to sway JC either. At first, he tried to get her an old Honda 100. The 14-year-old girl looked at the bike and then looked at Melvin in disappointment. Where's the fun and excitement? 
she asked. I mean, really, if you're going to get me a bike, might as well get all the cool accessories for it, right? So he relented and got her a 1998 Yamaha Yuzu 125. Yeah, it's a little bit older, he said. It's perfect, Jacy said, then got to work helping her grandfather prepare it. They made improvements to the bike, like adding a sleeve to the exhaust pipe and buying wider handlebars and lighter rims. Then they waited for the next Sunday to come along. That was my daughter. I wouldn't let her race in that class, the man said as they enrolled JC. Well, that's why she's not your daughter, Melvin responded firmly. Her first race, nine boys and her, was a disappointment as far as JC was concerned. After two heats, she finished in fourth place. What? Melvin asked in disbelief as a tearful JC helped him load the bike onto the trailer. What are you crying about? This was your first race. You beat six boys. Do you see any of them crying? But I wanted to win. JC cried out. Honey, we all do, Melvin said, hugging her tightly. Baby, next time, okay? Next time you'll do better, all right? Kenneth was a little upset when he received the photograph of a smiling JC, holding her second place trophy. And would you have listened to us if we told you not to race? Bernice wrote to him. Oh wait, we did tell you not to race and you still did it anyway. His heart skipped a beat when he saw the photograph of her racing. His little girl right in the middle of the bikes, fighting for the lead. Oh my goodness, he wrote to his father. I had no idea how scary that must have looked to you, to watch me doing all of that. And we made it through Melvin wrote, and we'll make it through this too. Melvin sent in the photographs of JC's first first place win, and Kenneth was shocked. It had rained almost non-stop the day before the track was completely muddy by the time the 125 class lined up at the gate. The boy to JC's left, Bobby Arino, JC knew, had a sneaky habit of crowding the people to the outside of the turn. The first turn was a turn to the left, meaning he would be pushing into her. So when the gate dropped, she moved slightly to her left, making it difficult for Bobby to pass. Mud splattered into her face, her chest, and her legs. JC was grateful for the goggles her grandpa made her wear, and grateful for the mouth guard her grandma made her wear. We spent too much money on that mouth of yours to let a rock knock your teeth out, Bernice fussed. I don't care if it looks silly you're wearing the guard. By the end of the first lap, JC had to wipe frantically at the goggles in order to see. She was leading by the second lap and didn't have to wipe at her goggles when no one is spraying mud in your face. You don't have to clean your goggles. You cut me off, Bobby accused as JC wiped her muddy face clean. Oh, poor baby JC taunted, her taunt all the more effective in her youthful voice. Watch your back next heat, Bobby said angrily. Next heat, Bobby did try to crowd her, but JC held her ground and Bobby was the one to yield in the first turn. A girl? Robert Arino exclaimed. You let a girl beat you? Come on, we're going home and putting this bike up for sale. I can't believe I paid all this money for you to let some little girl beat you. Kenneth was shocked at how dirty JC looked as she stood, holding her first place trophy. The next photograph showed her unzipping her leather jacket, revealing a completely soaked, filthy jersey. And in all the photographs, JC's dirty face was beaming with absolute joy. Do you still race? Elizabeth asked. Yeah, kind of moved up to the bigger class, got a Yee YZ 250, now JC smiled. Isn't it dangerous? Elizabeth asked. JC fought back the sarcastic response she was trying to get a job. Well, that's why we wear protective gear, JC explained. So when's the next race? Elizabeth asked. Sunday, Turkey Creek, JC smiled. Want to come? Elizabeth looked up sharply. Could people just look at her and tell that she was in a same gender relationship? There were no obvious signs from JC though, just a genuine warm smile. I don't know Elizabeth relaxed. I have a two-year-old, he might not like all that noise. You have boys? JC laughed. Most of them love all that noise. Michelle chose that inconvenient moment to interrupt her supervisor. Elizabeth had inherited the difficult and unprofessional Michelle from the previous branch manager and had written her up twice. Michelle's inappropriate attire, consisting of a sheer blouse and skirt that was too short, as far as Elizabeth was concerned, was the final straw. But Michelle sealed her fate by sending one of Grant Johnson's clients to Elizabeth's office instead of Grant's office, simply because the man appeared angry. Michelle disliked Elizabeth and would often send all difficult clients to her supervisor's office out of spite. You're not Grant, the man snarled after forcefully entering Elizabeth's office. Second door on the left, Elizabeth calmly told the man, then why did that incompetent woman tell me to go to the first door on the right? 
the man yelled, slamming Elizabeth's door shut. One final question, MS, K. Elizabeth asked, her anger evident. Do you have any visible tattoos? Um, just one, but it's only visible if I take off my top JC quietly admitted. She pointed to her left chest. It's a flaming heart, and inside it says I heart my daddy JC said, blushing. Nice Elizabeth smiled. I don't have any tattoos, but if I ever got one, that's what I would want it to say. I mean, my daddy is the most amazing man, but my mom never loved him, and... JC began to explain. Most amazing man in the world, second only to my daddy Elizabeth interrupted. No way. JC exclaimed in her youthful voice. Yes way, Elizabeth replied, extending her hand and giving JC's hand a firm shake. MS. K, I am currently looking for a new receptionist, with the possibility of advancement in the future. Are you interested? Elizabeth asked. Yes, ma'am, JC smiled happily. I apologize in advance if it's a bit of a learning curve. I doubt Michelle will be eager to help you out when I fire her, Elizabeth said. Could you wait in the lunchroom for now? It's the last door down on the left. Yes, ma'am, JC smiled. Jadia looked at Eric and fought back tears. So? Eric asked, growing uncomfortable in the silence. Baby, yes, you know I want to marry you. I love you so much, Jadia sighed. Then what's the issue? He asked trying to suppress his anger. Oh gosh, I know it sounds silly, but I really want my daddy to walk me down the aisle, Jadia said, a small sob catching in her throat. Is there a chance he'll get released soon? Eric asked. I don't know I should ask JC. She keeps up with all that stuff to she aside again. She cupped his face with her small hands and looked deeply into his eyes. Please believe me. I do love you. I can't wait to be Mrs. Eric Green, but, Ark, it's probably pretty silly. But the longer I wait, the more I hope that maybe my daddy will come home, J.D. admitted. J.C. let herself into her home. The house was quiet, but it always felt that way without Melvin and Bernice and Pebbles there. She had considered getting another cat after Pebbles passed away, but it felt like she would be betraying her sweet and loyal companion, so she didn't. She sighed with relief as she kicked off her shoes. Her first day on her new job had been fun, exciting, and a little nerve-wracking. Elizabeth had tried to help, but there were some aspects of the phone system that only Michelle knew about, and Michelle wasn't there to show JC. Michelle had gathered her personal items, angrily tossed her keys, and tearfully walked out of the building. JC carried her shoes to her bedroom, put them into the closet, then changed out of all of her clothes and slipped on her dad's baseball jersey. She was grateful that Grandma had never thrown any of her dad's things away after he got married and moved out. Jennifer stood outside of the bargain bin. So far, the five people she'd seen coming out and the two families she'd seen going in were beneath her, not impressive enough. But mom had made it pretty obvious find a job or find a new place to live. Even though Jadia now lived with her fiancé, and they had a pretty nice trailer, Jadia had hesitated and then finally gathered up the courage to tell her mother that there was no room for her. I provided you with a home for. Jennifer had argued with her oldest child. No, you didn't, Jadia had retorted. Dad did. You had nothing to do with it. And JC, that smug little person, living all alone in that huge house all by herself, had smiled sweetly and said in that terribly annoying soft voice of hers no and closed the door in her mother's face. Her very own mother's face. JC hadn't even invited her in, just opened the door and stared at her for a long moment. Can I help you? JC asked finally. Can I help? What? Jennifer had stammered. Is that how you greet your mother? Your very own mother? Well, I thought it was a little nicer than what the heck do you want. You mean self-centered person, JC had said. Jennifer stared at her youngest child, still a child at 21 years old, then finally stammered out that she needed a place to live. No. JC had said and closed the door. Jennifer heard the deadbolt click shut. Finally, she roused herself and got into Melissa's barely functioning car and drove to the bargain bin. The sign out front said that they were hiring. She steeled herself, opened the door, and entered the large building. Hi, welcome to the bargain bin, a young woman greeted her. Anything specific I can help you find? A job, Jennifer admitted. Oh, you're in luck. The young woman smiled widely. We're really busy here. You can multitask, you're hired. Even if I have a record? Jennifer asked. Aha, I have a record too, Mindy Laporte admitted. Two, actually. Possession with intent to distribute Schedule two drugs and attempted second-degree murder, plus a couple of charges for asking for money. Grace doesn't care about that as long as you show up, do your job, and don't try to take advantage. 
She turned and waved to a large woman that was talking with a customer. Plus sizes right over there, buy three. Get 20% off the fourth item of equal or lesser price, right Mindy? Grace said. She's looking for a job but says she's worried because she has a record, Mindy explained, and then beamed brightly as three high school boys wandered in. Yeah? Me too, Grace shrugged. Even got the tattoos to prove it's saint. Gabriel's. You? Me too, saint. Gabriel served five years for an arson I didn't commit, Jennifer said. Like playing with matches? Grace asked, hiding her smirk. No, I didn't do it, Jennifer retorted. Okay, come with me, Grace said, and walk to the back of the store. Here, fill this out, find yourself an apron under that cabinet, walk around the store and figure out where things are. Then get busy, Grace said, handing Jennifer a single-page application. And hurry up, huh? Mike didn't show up, so we're short-staffed. Get busy doing what? Jennifer asked, worried. Just helping people, showing them where things are. Then when we close at nine, help clean up. In the meantime, if you see something on the floor, pick it up, put it where it belongs, Grace said, then left Jennifer to fill out the application. Great, Jennifer said, unhappily. She filled out the application, found a bargain bin apron, and then looked around. The layout was fairly simple. Baby and children's clothes were toward the front right-hand side of the store. Larger children in the middle right-hand side, then the men's section was in the rear right-hand side. Petites and juniors were in the front left-hand side, followed by clearance racks in the middle left, and then the plus-size section was in the rear left. And in the middle were all the normal woman's clothes. Oh, this top is cute, she commented as she picked up a top that had slid off a hanger. Employees get a 40% discount on non-sale items, 10% on sale items, Mindy cheerfully said as she busily passed by, arms laden with several tops. JC indulged in her favorite pastime, looking at the photograph albums Melvin and Burness had compiled of her daddy. Kenneth had been an only child, so there were several photographs of him taken over the years. She smiled affectionately as she looked at the photographs of his childhood. Sipping her single glass of juice, JC looked at his teenage years, looking again at the photograph of his senior prom. The smiling girl with her handsome daddy was a mystery to her. It was the only photograph of the dark-haired girl. Melvin and Bernice had admitted they couldn't remember the woman's name, and she wasn't in any of daddy's high school yearbooks. The photographs of his baseball glory days made her sad he could have achieved so much more than just working at a mattress factory. But he had made the right choice, what he believed was the right choice, and married her mother. She looked at the wedding album and smiled at Jennifer's white gown, the noise in Angola never stops, even at night. It's just a different kind of noise. Kenneth lay awake, not paying attention to the chaos going on around him. Jalissa had succumbed to a serious illness both JC and Jadia had sent him letters informing him of her passing. JC had written that the nurse's aide told her that his letter was her favorite Jalissa insisted that the aide read it to her every day. So I read it to her one more time, JC wrote. It made me teary-eyed your words were so beautiful. I care about you, Daddy. I care about you. Kenneth said out loud. Amidst the echoes of shouts, laughter, sounds of discomfort, clinking and clanging, no one heard his words. The end.